Did you know? At the 2009 Game Developers Conference, Nintendo hardware designer Masato Kawahara showed off an unreleased successor to the Game Boy. This device was a precursor to the Game Boy Advance, and was codenamed Project Atlantis. The Atlantis name was chosen because the system was planned to release during the 1996 Olympics, which was taking place in Atlanta. This system had comparable specs to the Game Boy Advance, and would have been an incredibly powerful handheld for the time. British hardware designers Arm Holdings were contracted to create a power-saving ARM 710 CPU for Atlantis. This chip would have allegedly been so efficient that batteries could power Atlantis for up to 30 hours. However, the ARM CPU turned out to be inefficient for the device's needs, which caused performance issues. The device's internal components and form factor also led to its large size, which was ultimately the project's downfall. It was so huge that it couldn't fit inside the average pocket. While Nintendo were developing Atlantis, they allegedly made a game alongside the system titled Mario's Castle, though nothing on this game exists publicly and it's unknown if the title was transformed into another game. Nintendo went back to square one on their Game Boy successor, but this left them with a problem. It would take several years to develop a replacement for Atlantis, and the Game Boy was already nearly a decade old. Both gamers and developers were expecting Nintendo to release new hardware that was closer to the performance of rival handhelds. Nintendo decided to develop an updated Game Boy with a fast a processor and color display that would satisfy these needs until a true Game Boy successor came to market. In August 1999, word leaked that Nintendo was working on a new handheld system known as the Advanced Game Boy, and just one month after the rumors first spread, Nintendo formally announced the Game Boy Advance. After going back to the drawing board, development of the Game Boy Advance took about two years. It also took Nintendo just over a year to decide which CPU the system would use. A system's CPU CPU needs to be powerful enough to process the amount of information being displayed on screen. Because of this, Nintendo explored several different screen sizes while deciding on the Advance's CPU. According to designer Masahiko Ota, the team even considered making the Advance's screen vertical instead of horizontal. They also looked into making the device itself vertical like previous Game Boys. Nintendo wanted the system to be comparable to the Super Nintendo in terms of power for easy porting of games, but with some additions. Their desire to essentially make a handheld SNES can be seen in the Advance's early dev kits, which had SNES controllers wired onto their circuit boards. Nintendo also stated that cell phone connectivity would be a major focus for the new system. They claimed that by connecting a cell phone to the Game Boy Advance, players would be able to download and play multiplayer games, enter chat rooms, and read email, all on the Advance itself. In August 2000, Nintendo released more information about the Game Boy Advance, including its design, battery life, and price. Nintendo Nintendo of America board member Peter Main announced the system would have some kind of modem, but no other information was given. By that time, developers had advanced development kits in their hands, and there wasn't a shred of any internet or network support for the system. The final look of the Game Boy Advance was made by French designer Gwenel Nicolas and his studio Curiosity Inc. This wasn't the only shape Nintendo experimented with, however. Even before the original Advance was finalized, Nintendo tested a clamshell design similar to the Game Boy Advance SP. The hardware team temporarily abandoned the clamshell, believing it to be too thick. One thing the team refused to abandon was backwards compatibility. Nintendo literally checked every single Game Boy and Game Boy Color game on the Advance to make sure it was fully backwards compatible. Hardware designer Ryuji Umezu said, We're checking all of the previous Game Boy games for compatibility. There are a lot of titles, so that is pretty difficult. We have Nintendo employees along with part-time staff checking all of them. The Game Boy Advance was programmed to switch over to Game Boy Color mode when it detected the contents of a Game Boy or Color cartridge. However, Nintendo Research and Engineering General Manager Satoru Okada couldn't get this code to work. Okada then asked engineers to make a physical switch in the system's cartridge slot to change modes instead. The Game Boy Micro lacked this physical switch, and therefore lost the ability to play Game Boy or Game Boy Color games. The Game Boy Advance had instant and continued success, so much so that Nintendo released a redesigned system called the SP, which was an abbreviation for Special. Four 
former Nintendo president Satoru Iwata wanted to include a sleep mode on the SP, but it couldn't be implemented within their time frame. Having learned from his mistake, Iwata demanded a sleep mode be included in the Nintendo DS from the start. Nintendo also experimented with a touchscreen panel adapter for the SP, which would also be included as standard in the Nintendo DS. Nintendo even tried using 3D LCD tech with the SP, but they weren't happy with the results. The resolution was too small to produce a pleasing 3D image, and the processing power of the Advance struggled to render stereoscopic images. After the SP, Nintendo launched the Game Boy Micro, but this wasn't the last piece of Game Boy Advance hardware to be released. The Vistian Dockable Entertainment featuring Game Boy Advance was released in 2006 and was a DVD player that could play Advance games. The device was portable and meant for traveling in a car or other vehicle. Because of its specialized nature, the Vistian system couldn't be purchased at general retailers and was instead sold at car dealerships. Vistian was apparently interested in creating similar products using hardware from the DS and Wii, but neither of these projects came to fruition. Speaking of unusual Game Boy Advance hardware, there's an Advance add-on that was specifically made to help young people with diabetes. The Gluco Boy has two full video games and mini arcades stored on it. Whenever the user tests their blood levels with the Gluco Boy, they earn points that can be used to unlock games or purchase in-game items and features. The add-on was made after its creator, Paul Wessel, noticed his son wasn't testing his blood levels as often as he should be. Wessel decided that since his son loved playing his Game Boy Advance, he'd make something that incentivized the boy to check his blood levels more often. Similar to how the Super Game Boy allowed Game Boy games to be played on a TV through their SNES, the Wide Boy 64 allowed gamers to play advanced games on their TV through a Nintendo 64. These adapters were made for private use and allowed developers and publications to view games on a bigger screen. The Wide Boy 64 was developed by Intelligent Systems, who also created the Fire Emblem and Paper Mario series. However, the term Wide Boy is a generic name for adapters that allow Game Boy Family games to be played through a console console, and have been made for several Nintendo consoles. In fact, two other Wide Boy adapters were made for the Nintendo 64 specifically to play Game Boy and Game Boy Color games. Much like the Super Game Boy, the Wide Boy 64 has almost all of the components of a Game Boy Advance inside it, besides the screen and buttons. Game Boy Advance games also came to other consoles via emulation through the Virtual Console. What's interesting about this is that the Game Boy Advance emulation on the Wii U wasn't even programmed by Nintendo. It was instead developed by the company M2, who are best known for their work on the eShop's 3D Classics series, as well as the Sega Ages series. This isn't the only Advance-related tech that wasn't developed by Nintendo. The technology in the system's Game Boy Advance video cartridges was actually developed by 4Kids Technology. These video cartridges were manufactured by Majesco Entertainment, with the exception of the Pokemon video cartridges, which were made by Nintendo. Using its established franchises, Nintendo made several tech demos to illustrate the Game Boy Advance's visuals, including a Zelda 2 and Yoshi's Story demo. However, other companies have used Nintendo characters as placeholders in their own tech demos. One of these demos is Mario Kart XXL by Daenerys Entertainment Software. The demo has Mario driving around a course with some interesting visuals. The purpose of the demo was to show how multiple background layers can be used to create the illusion of vertical depth. The result is something like having two of the SNES's Mode 7 layers rendering at the same time. Did you know? Although the DS was very profitable for Nintendo, the system's games are one of the most pirated products in gaming history. In 2010, Japan's Computer Entertainment Suppliers Association published a list of Japan's most pirated DS games. CESA's findings showed that the 20 best-selling DS games were downloaded almost 20 million times collectively in Japan. Pokemon Platinum was illegally downloaded almost 2.1 million times, a figure that nearly matched the game's 2.7 million regional sales. Most of this piracy can be attributed to flash cartridges such as the R4, which allowed users to play DS ROM files using a micro SD card. Nintendo took measures to combat piracy on their platforms, but with limited success. In 2008, Nintendo teamed up with 54 other video game companies to take legal action to halt sales of R4 units. Their lawsuit used Japan's unfair competition prevention law and asked that 
all companies involved with the R4s to stop importing, selling, and advertising the devices. Unfortunately, Nintendo's actions had little effect, and consumers continued to buy R4 devices online. In 2009, Nintendo publicly called out the governments of China, South Korea, Brazil, Mexico, Spain, and Paraguay. A statement was made about each country and how piracy was negatively affecting Nintendo in each region, in hopes of the governments cracking down on pirates. This, too, seemed to have little effect. The system has a fairly interesting history. The DS wasn't originally intended to be the successor to the Game Boy line of handheld consoles. At the time of its release, Nintendo was still supporting both the Game Boy Advance and GameCube, and the DS was planned to launch as a third pillar alongside these systems. Most likely, this was due to the fact that the DS was a more experimental piece of hardware, and Nintendo didn't want to risk devaluing the Game Boy brand should the new system fail. The DS also marked a major turning point for Nintendo as a company. While speaking about the upcoming release of the DS, former Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamauchi stated that Nintendo's goal at that time was to help lift Japan out of economic depression. They planned to do this by re-energizing the game market, though they were uncertain about the future of their own company. Yamauchi even went so far as to state that if the DS succeeds, we will rise to heaven, but if it fails, we will sink to hell. Despite all concerns, the Nintendo DS proved to be a massive success. As of 2018, it is officially the number one best-selling game system in the United States and the second best-selling system in the world, after Sony's PlayStation 2. The DS went through several different code names while in development. Its earliest iteration was known as Iris, a name that predates the system's dual screens. The official Nintendo DS emulation software was called Ensata, named after the Iris Ensata flower, commonly known as simply the Japanese Iris. As former Nintendo president Satoru Iwata described, Iris was just the code name of next-generation hardware designed to succeed the Game Boy Advance. It's often speculated that the Ensata emulator was developed by Intelligent Systems. However, there is little evidence to prove this. The code of Insata only has copyrights relating to Nintendo, which implies it was developed in-house. The source of this confusion may have been the fact that Intelligent Systems developed the hardware tools for the DS. Before the handheld was officially revealed, leaks indicated that its final name kept going back and forth between the Nintendo DS and Nintendo Nitro. In an Iwata Asks interview, Iwata confirmed that Nitro was one of the code names used for the device. As a holdover from when it was codenamed the Nitro, the serial numbers printed on DS game cards all begin with the letters NTR. The final name for the system, the Nintendo DS, actually has two meanings. On the surface, it stands for dual screen. However, according to Nintendo, it also stands for developer's system, as it was meant to give game creators brand new tools which will lead to more innovative games. In 2004, Nintendo filed a trademark for game hardware under the name City Boy, suggesting that this might have been another name name considered for the DS. According to games journalist Emily Rogers, the City Boy name was meant to help market Nintendo's handheld systems to a younger, more modern demographic. It was also chosen to compete against the growing mobile phone game industry. The Nintendo DS also has the unique distinction of being physically carried to the highest point on Earth. Mountain climbers Neil Mueller and Chris Grubb brought their DS systems with them during their ascent of Mount Everest. While most of the team's electronics were ruined during the climb, their DS system survived the entire ascent. The devices managed to endure the bitter cold, fierce winds, and having curry spilled directly on them while the team Sherpa guides played them in the kitchen. A large part of the DS's international appeal was its lack of region locking, as all DS systems can play any game from any region. The only exception to this is the Chinese version, known as the IQ DS. This version of the DS can still play games from any region, but games released specifically for the IQ DS are region locked and cannot be played on regular DS systems. Attempting to do so will simply trigger a message that says, only for IQ DS. Oddly, this region locking only functions on the original DS as all versions of the DSi and 3DS can play IQ DS games without issue. Only six games were released for the IQ DS. Super Mario 64 DS, New Super Mario Bros, Yoshi Touch and Go, WarioWare Touched, Polarium, and a version of Nintendogs that came pre-installed on the upgraded IQ DSi. Another region-specific quirk can be found while setting up the DS's Wi-Fi connection settings. Japanese DS systems have an option to connect to the internet using a portable Wi-Fi 
router. Because these routers are used almost exclusively in Japan, the option to use it was removed internationally. However, there is a workaround for users to access the option outside of Japan. In order to do so, the user has to specifically calibrate the touchscreen incorrectly by touching the bottom right corner of the screen when asked to touch the middle. While on the Wi-Fi setup menu, this option can then be accessed by touching the very top left corner of the touchscreen. This is still possible to do even in the 3DS's version of the menu. The Nintendo Wi-Fi connection instruction booklet included with the DS also contains an interesting secret. One page of the booklet explains the steps to input a web key in order to connect to a wireless router. In the example picture, the code used for the web key is 8675309. This is a reference to the 1981 pop song 8675309 Jenny by Tommy Two-Tone. This isn't the only Easter egg for the DS system. If the player starts up their DS on their birthday, the boot-up sound will have a slightly higher pitch. And if they continue into the PictoChat application and go to a room, they will receive a happy birthday message. Although having multiple brightness levels was an advertised feature of the DS Lite, later shipments of the original DS actually had support for multiple brightness levels as well. However, there was no way to actually take advantage of it outside of homebrew applications. The DS and DS Lite eventually received a significant hardware overhaul in the form of the DSi, which included new features such as cameras and SD card support. The the system's name was inspired by the Nintendo Wii, with the single I meant to convey individuality and emphasize the idea of players personalizing their own systems. The sound editor was included as a last second addition at the insistence of Shigeru Miyamoto, which actually contains an interesting easter egg. While on the sound selection menu, if the player highlights one of their recorded sounds and waits for about a minute, the sound editor will start playing a rendition of the Super Mario Bros. theme, composed from the highlighted sound. <laughs> The DSi's cameras were a key component to the system's redesign. Satoru Iwata compared the device's microphone and touchscreen as its ears and sense of touch, so the cameras were intended to give the system eyes. The DSi included two cameras, one on the front of the system and one on the back. These cameras actually take pictures at a resolution two and a half times greater than the resolution of the DSi's screen, so the pictures could be zoomed in without losing detail. Originally, the design team only intended to include one camera and make the top screen able to swivel around in order to take pictures both in front and behind the system. However, the swivel mechanic was deemed too expensive and impractical, so the decision was made to include a camera on both sides. Another feature that had to be cut was a second game slot, something that had been heavily requested by both fans and Nintendo employees. Upon the first presentation of the DSi prototype, however, company executives expressed concern at the system's bulk, and the second game slot had to be removed in order to make the DSi smaller. Did you know? The Nintendo 3DS wasn't the first system Nintendo wanted to make 3D. As well as the obvious Virtual Boy, Nintendo tried to implement 3D in several other consoles. However, none of these attempts progressed well enough for them to publicly announce the hardware. A 3D screen accessory for the GameCube got very far into development. The device even had a 3D version of Luigi's Mansion running on it. But plans to produce the screen were put aside due to high costs. Nintendo secretly displayed this 3D screen at E3 2002, but left it in 2D mode and neglected to tell anyone that it was actually capable of 3D. Interestingly, it displayed footage of Luigi's Mansion, Metroid Prime, and an early version of Fantasy Star Online Episode 3, perhaps suggesting that all three games had 3D iterations. Nintendo also tried using 3D LCD tech with the Game Boy Advance SP, but they weren't happy with the results. Former Nintendo president Satoru Iwata told VentureBeat, When we saw 3D images on the Game Boy Advance SP, we saw the resolution wasn't good, and the parallax barrier display available wasn't functional well. The graphical processing power of the GBA also wasn't good enough. A parallax barrier is a filter placed in front of a screen to achieve 3D without glasses. With this kind of 3D, a screen will show two different images from slightly different angles. These images are broken up into vertical columns of pixels and then interlaced. A parallax barrier blocks one set of columns from being viewed by the left eye and another set of columns from being viewed by the right eye, and because of this, each eye sees a separate image. The brain then processes these two images in the same way it processes depth in the real world, creating the illusion of 3D. 
Although simple and effective, this technique also has its shortcomings. All LCD displays have a fixed pixel resolution, so when two images are interlaced on screen this way, the horizontal resolution is effectively cut in half. With 3D, the Game Boy Advance's resolution of 240 by 160 pixels would have seemed more like 120 by 160, which is fewer pixels than the original Game Boy. One way around this would have been to double the resolution to 480 by 160, but this would mean rendering twice as many pixels and putting more strain on the hardware. Creating 3D images by layering 2D games also sharpens the edges of objects, which would have made the Game Boy Advance's low-resolution sprites seem even more pixelated. Despite this, Iwata seemed to be fond of the Game Boy Advance prototype as he kept it in his personal drawer. 3D was important to several members of Nintendo's management, including Gunpei Yokoi, Shigeru Miyamoto, and Iwata. In fact, the first project Iwata and Miyamoto worked on together actually featured 3D. It was a Japan-exclusive racing game starring Mario and Luigi called Famicom Grand Prix 2 3D Hot Rally. Co-developed by Nintendo and Halo, it utilized the commercially unsuccessful Famicom 3D system. In an Iwata Asks interview, Miyamoto described the 3D feature as having universal appeal, and believes this appeal is why Nintendo tried so many times to make 3D work. Nintendo's main concern with 3D was the consumers. They might not own a compatible TV, or be willing to purchase expensive equipment to play 3D games. And if Nintendo were unable to bundle the necessary accessories for a 3D console at launch, not everyone would buy the required hardware. This would negate the point of designing games with 3D in mind, and is what ultimately stopped them from producing 3D products. Miyamoto has stated that Nintendo tried to work 3D into all of their hardware after the Virtual Boy up until the launch of the 3DS, but this apparently wasn't the case for the original DS. According to Iwata, they never thought of doing 3D with the DS, partially due to their previous failed experiments. They were also focused on the dual screen and touch screen concepts, and couldn't focus on or afford to implement anything else. The natural power increase of the 3DS helped Nintendo embrace 3D. The device was powerful enough that they didn't have to deal with the issues that halted the 3D Game Boy Advance prototype. Similar to the unused GBA prototype, the 3DS uses a parallax barrier to present 3D. Nintendo tried to implement 3D with both of the 3DS screens, but ran into problems with the touchscreen. Iwata explained, As we experimented, we realized that finger marks and other smudges reduced the 3D's impact, and so did the decreased transparency of the touchscreen itself. In other words, a touchscreen and 3D screen do not get along very well. Screens were originally tested using a 3D render of Mario and Luigi, but were later tested using a special 3D version of Mario Kart Wii. Nintendo also tried to innovate outside of 3D. There was actually a 3DS prototype where the D-pad and circle pad could switch positions. For a time, Nintendo considered putting this functionality into the final product, allowing players to physically move the inputs around. Unlike the DS, engineers made the 3DS as small as possible from the outset, which is why the system never received a smaller revision such as the DS Lite or DSi. Surprisingly, the most difficult part of the 3DS to implement may have been the cameras. Although they aren't high-end, the cameras needed to be very precisely aligned. If even one of the cameras was slightly off-angle, taking 3D pictures just wouldn't have worked properly. The 3D depth slider on the side of the 3DS was first suggested by a Nintendo engineer, and then personally requested by Miyamoto. Since people have varying levels of visual impairment and comfort, having a fixed amount of 3D could cause eye strain for some players. Miyamoto also wanted a physical slider on the outside of the device so players could change 3D without opening a system menu. He even suggested its importance would be equal to a volume control slider. Nintendo took every precaution necessary to protect its customers' health. They warned that children 6 years old and younger shouldn't use the device's 3D mode, and even added a parental feature to restrict 3D. Despite Nintendo clearly stating any possible health risks, there was still backlash, and many parents were concerned. Several experts weighed in on the issue, with Karen Sparrow of the Association of Optometrists stating, Children need a clear, sharp image in each eye in order for their vision to develop properly. If a child spends excessive time using a device such as the 3DS, it could effectively act as a negative exercise, causing 
causing a lazy eye. Nintendo eventually created a version of the console without 3D, the Nintendo 2DS, to fully address these concerns. However, experts from an entirely different organization believe the 3DS may have medical benefits. Michael Dunis of the American Optometric Association said the 3DS could help identify depth perception issues in young children. If a child has trouble perceiving the 3D, they may need vision therapy, and the issue is much easier to fix if caught at a young age. Interestingly, Nintendo didn't announce the 3DS at E3 or a similar press conference. Instead, the company unceremoniously disclosed its existence at an investor meeting. The timing of the announcement was curious as it drew attention away from Nintendo's recently launched DSi XL. Several news outlets speculated that Nintendo revealed the 3DS early to circumvent impending leaks before E3. However, despite Nintendo's efforts, some features of the 3DS were leaked over a year before it was officially announced. In February of 2010, an anonymous third-party developer told CBG that the DS's successor would have motion sensing technology similar to an iPhone. Although new to handhelds, this feature was actually considered for the original DS. Miyamoto told the New York Times that he wanted to include some sort of tilt or gyroscopic technology in the DS, but left the functionality out to focus on the dual screens. The Street Pass capabilities of the 3DS were inspired by similar features in Nintendogs and Dragon Quest IX for the DS. The 3DS has other, more obscure inspirations. In 2006, the Shiguridin Museum was founded by former Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamauchi. The museum presents an anthology of 100 classic Japanese poems using modern technology, and the museum can even be toured using the Nintendo DS. When Shiguridin was being set up, Yamauchi wished that the exhibits could jump out at the visitors, and from his desire, some experimentation was done using 3D displays. Yamauchi had a reputation of being somewhat of a visionary, and even came up with the original idea of having two screens on the DS. Yamauchi's desire for 3D exhibits would eventually come to fruition, only not at Shiguridin. The Nintendo 3DS Guide Louvre is an app designed for visitors of the Louvre Museum in Paris, and has been available since April of 2012. It was originally intended only to be installed on rentable 3DS units at the Louvre, but a home version was also released on the eShop in 2013, and a physical version was made available at the Louvre's gift shop. Interestingly, this application is the only software on the Nintendo 3DS that is region-free, with Nintendo reasoning that since the artwork at the Louvre didn't need an age and content rating, it didn't need a region lock either. Though the 3DS has gone on to be a successful system, selling nearly 60 million units worldwide, the console initially struggled to sell. In an attempt to attract more gamers to the handheld, Nintendo cut the price of the 3DS from $250 to just $170 in the US only six months after its release. Its failure hit the company so hard that Iwata took a 50% pay cut, with other key members of staff taking 20-30% to reductions in pay as well. The company also introduced the Nintendo 3DS Ambassador Program to compensate early adopters who bought the console at full price. This offered them a set of free NES and Game Boy Advance games from the virtual console. The 3DS also has several secrets and easter eggs, some of which are rather strange. Inside the 3DS, there's a stereoscopic image of a rhinoceros skull. This image was likely used for testing purposes, and can be found in the system's debug MPO folder. Another 3D image can be found in the data for the Street Pass Me Plaza, again likely used to test the 3D. The 3DS eShop also contains the title theme for Mario Kart Double Dash. The exact purpose of the music is unknown, but it has some relation to testing Street Pass. Did you know? Much like how some Game Boy games have bonus content when played on a Game Boy Color, several color games unlock special features when played on a Game Boy Advance. Four examples of this are Shantae, Wendy, Every Which Way, and both The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Ages and Seasons. When played on a GBA, Shantae has new items and abilities, Wendy, Every Which Way has three new levels, and the Oracle's games unlock a special advanced shop where players can buy exclusive items. These last two games even comment on the obscurity of the bonus content content, with the store's owner Stockwell telling the player, I'm amazed you found us. The success of the Game Boy line meant it penetrated pop culture and reached new audiences. In 1991, the system found its way to NBA star Lionel Simmons, who developed tendinitis in his right arm due to excessive amounts of Game Boy play. Simmons had to miss two basketball games while he was in recovery from hardcore gaming. The Game Boy was popular with more than just athletes, it was also popular with astronauts. The Game Boy was even the first gaming console played in outer space. The system, loaded with a copy of Tetris, was played by Russian cosmonaut Alexander Sarah 
Cerebrov. He sent the device back to Earth with a note saying, During flight, in rare minutes of leisure, I enjoyed playing Game Boy. The console, game, and note were sold in a charity auction for $1,220 in May 2011. Overall, Cerebrov's Game Boy spent 196 days in space, orbiting the Earth over 3,000 times. Nintendo's Game Boy released in 1989 and was designed by industry veteran Gunpei Yokoi. Yokoi began developing the system in 1986, but the console's origins date all the way back to 1979. That year, on a train ride home, Yokoi saw a businessman playing with a pocket calculator Later, randomly pressing buttons to pass the time. It was in that moment Yokoi saw the utility of a handheld video game. At the time, Nintendo almost exclusively made toys, and had only experimented in the video game market with their color TV game system. But Yokoi had designed several successful toys for Nintendo, and his ideas held a lot of weight at the company. In 1980, Nintendo released Ball, the first title in Yokoi's Game & Watch series, and Nintendo's very first handheld video game. It used a custom-printed LCD screen designed to show pre to find characters and objects. Predefined art circumvented the need for dynamic displays using pixels. This saved on the amount of processing power the game needed, and allowed for the handheld to be made using inexpensive components. Other handheld electronic games from that era were mostly card games or sports games, so the Game & Watch series was viewed as a creative new approach with broader appeal. Over the course of 11 years, 59 different Game & Watch titles were produced, selling over 43 million units worldwide. The multi-screen series of the Game & Watch games even inspired the creation of the Nintendo DS. The 1982 port of Donkey Kong for Game & Watch was the first video game to feature the cross-shaped directional pad, or D-pad, control scheme. The D-pad earned a Technology and Engineering Emmy Award, and was later patented by Nintendo and used in the NES and Game Boy. The Game Boy was internally called the DMG, or Dot Matrix game. Even though more advanced technology was available, the Game Boy's hardware was chosen to be cost-efficient and use as little power as possible, just like the Game & Watch. The LCD screen of the Game Boy was given a blank green background because, in testing, green contrasted better with the LCD overlay in different levels of light. Yokoi has called his design philosophy, lateral thinking of withered technology. Withered technology refers to technology that is older, cheaper, and well understood, and lateral thinking refers to using that old technology in new and innovative ways. The price point and battery life of the Game Boy gave Nintendo an edge over more powerful handheld systems like the Atari Lynx and the Sega Game Gear, both of which came out around the same time as the Game Boy. Sega in particular seemed to resent the success of the Game Boy, and opened one of their Game Gear commercials by showing a Game Boy and stating, if you were colorblind and had an IQ of less than 12, then you wouldn't mind which portable you had. During the Gulf War, one American soldier's Game Boy withstood an explosion during a bombing raid. The system suffered cosmetic damage, but was still operational. It was even displayed at the Nintendo Store in New York City for several years. The Game Boy also crossed cultural boundaries despite government bans. After World War II, South Korea placed an embargo on Japanese products. So in 1990, instead of Nintendo selling the device, Korean company Hyundai did, renaming it the Mini Comboy. Hyundai sold several Japanese consoles under alternative names during this time, including the Genesis, NES, Master System, Game Gear, and Super Nintendo. The first backlit Game Boy wasn't the Game Boy Advance SP, but the Game Boy Lite. The Game Boy Lite was released in Japan in 1998, and was never sold in any other region. Nintendo had been working on a new Game Boy before the Lite was even announced, as early as 1995. It was codenamed Project Atlantis, and was based on a 32-bit processor. Magazines at the time suggested it was capable of running Super Nintendo standard games, and rumored that it'd be released in 1997. By the time 1997 came around, though, the console was nowhere to be seen. Instead, Nintendo released the Game Boy Color in 1998 as a stopgap so developers could spend more time working on Project Atlantis, which became the Game Boy Advance. Even though the Game Boy Color was only a modest upgrade over the previous Game Boy, it did add more than just color. The CPU was twice as fast, and it had four times the memory of the Game Boy. Another interesting fact is that in the Game Boy Color logo, each letter of the word color represents one of the five colors the system originally launched in. Throughout the life of the Game Boy Color, Nintendo experimented with ideas that would become basic features in later hardware releases. The Color was the first gaming handheld to offer wireless communication. The system had an infrared communications port at the top, which used the same technology found in a TV remote. Though it was more primitive than modern wireless connectivity, it was still capable of trading information in games like Pokémon and Harry Potter. The Game Boy Color was also the first Nintendo handheld to have a motion-controlled game. 
Kirby's tilt and tumble was controlled almost entirely by a series of accelerometers that were built into the cartridge, which was a first for video games. The original Game Boy line, including the Game Boy Color, sold 118.69 million units worldwide, and with this success came many innovative and unique peripherals for the Game Boy line of handhelds. There was also a sewing machine that had compatibility with the Game Boy. The Singer Isec sewing machine connected to the game via link cable, and allowed users to design patterns with a special game cartridge. Another obscure accessory for the Game Boy was the iCard cartridge. It was a radio transmitter that would use the Game Boy to display real-time information about times, scores, schedules, and results for the American Le Mans series races. In 1998, Nintendo released the Game Boy Camera and Game Boy Printer. The Game Boy Camera held the world record of being the smallest digital camera of its time. Singer-songwriter Neil Young released the album Silver and Gold in the year 2000. The album's cover photo was taken with a Game Boy camera. The Game Boy camera also had a few Easter eggs. If the player presses B during the credit sequence, a short video of Shigeru Miyamoto dancing will play. The Game Boy printer also has an Easter egg. If the device is turned on while the user holds the feed button, an image of Mario with the word hello will be printed on the paper. Nintendo also sold a special Zelda edition of the Game Boy camera through the Nintendo Power magazine. The cartridge was gold rather than black, and many of the graphics and clip art from the original were replaced with Zelda graphics. Another special edition of the Game Boy camera was never released. It was based around the characters and images from the Japanese magazine Koro Koro Comics. Even though it was never released, much of the unique content from this version still exists in the ROM of the original Japanese Game Boy camera. Also on the Japanese version, there's a print icon that shows a syringe. This is because many older printers use syringes to refill their inkjets. However, syringes are often associated with drug use in the West, so the icon was replaced with a Game Boy printer icon in the international versions. Another Game Boy accessory was the Super Game Boy. Super Game Boy was an adapter for the Super Nintendo to play Game Boy games on the TV. What's interesting about the device is that the Super Nintendo didn't have the ability to emulate Game Boy games. Instead, the Super Game Boy itself contained most of the same hardware that was in an actual Game Boy, minus the screen and buttons. Another Game Boy peripheral of sorts was the Game Link Cable. The Link Cable impacted the world even beyond video games, as it was the basis for Apple's Firewire connectors. Two more bizarre Game Boy peripherals are the Pocket Sonar and the Petty Sedate. The Game Boy Pocket Sonar was made by Bandai for the original Game Boy, and used sonar to locate underwater fish. It was the first sonar-based gaming accessory and retailed in Japan for 14,800 yen, about 115 US dollars at the time. It even had a built-in fishing minigame. The Petty Sedate, on the other hand, would connect to a Game Boy device and dole out nitrous oxide to the children playing. Its general purpose was to reduce stress when children needed to be sedated. One unreleased Game Boy accessory was shown by DSi designer Masato Kuahara at the 2009 Game Developers Conference. It was a touch panel that went over the screen of the Game Boy Color. It was abandoned because it apparently didn't work well without a backlight. The touch panel was attempted again with the Game Boy Advance SP, and operated more favorably because of its backlit screen. Kuahara stated the touch panel was not well received by Nintendo management, but that Shigeru Miyamoto liked the general concept. Masato Kuahara said he likes to think his design helped influence the creation of the Nintendo DS. Did you know? Before Nintendo became the video game powerhouse they are today, they produced toys and playing cards. Even legendary video game designer Shigeru Miyamoto's first project at the company was making package designs for a Disney-themed board game. But this business model would be drastically altered after the creation of the Game & Watch series, Nintendo's first successful entry into the handheld video game market. After the 1964 Tokyo Olympics, Nintendo's tried-and-true business model was in dire trouble. They struggled to stay afloat, with then president President Hiroshi Yamauchi experimenting with a variety of business ventures such as taxis and love hotels. While these ventures weren't successful, Nintendo saw some potential in the toy market, especially since they had some experience in the industry with themed playing cards. Gunpei Yokoi, who at the time was an engineer at Nintendo, brought one of their earliest successes, the Ultra Hand, an extendable arm that grabbed things from a distance. The Ultra Hand would go on to sell 1.2 million units, and Yokoi was eventually promoted within Nintendo to lead research development one group. One day while Gunpei Yokoi was traveling on the bullet train from Tokyo to Kyoto, he noticed a passenger near him using a calculator as a toy to pass time. 
That's when Yokoi began to wonder if a portable gaming device would have a market. His epiphany led to the creation of the Game & Watch series, Nintendo's first portable gaming system. Yokoi's pitch to Hiroshi Yamauchi for the Game & Watch was a series of lucky coincidences. Yamauchi's personal driver was sick one day, and Yokoi was asked to drive Yamauchi's Cadillac. Yokoi loved foreign cars and was one of the few people at the company who could drive it. During the drive, Yokoi pitched his idea for Game & Watch to Yamauchi, who didn't seem particularly enthusiastic. Days later, executives from Sharp came to Nintendo, and Yamauchi enthusiastically brought Yokoi on to develop the idea. Nintendo ended up partnering with Sharp, known at the time for their work on calculators, in order to make the Game & Watch. For the series, Gunpei Yokoi wanted to create something that was small and could easily fit in people's hands and pockets discreetly. This is because Yokoi felt that businessmen would be embarrassed to pull out a big gaming machine in public. This led the team to focus on a small, rectangular design that could be inconspicuously held in their hands. However, this origin story might not be entirely accurate, and is actually up for debate. In an interview with Retro Gamer, Satoru Okada, who worked with Gunpei Yokoi closely, stated that the MB Microvision directly inspired Nintendo's Game & Watch series. Okada and Yokoi enjoyed playing games on it, but they didn't understand why it was so big. Even with different games on the MB Microvision, the graphics and gameplay were basically the same due to its 16x16 16 16 pixel display. The two imagined a smaller device with better graphics, and eventually settled on a calculator-like screen for the device. Since the events surrounding the Game & Watch's creation occurred over 40 years ago, and Gunpei Okoi is unfortunately no longer with us, it's unlikely that we'll ever know the true origins of the series. The game Ball was the first title in the Game & Watch series, and went on sale on April 28, 1980, selling around a quarter of a million units. In Ball, players control a nondescript person who juggles balls. Ball has been re-released and remixed several times over the years, most recently with the Game & Watch Mario. One of the more surprising inclusions was with a Japanese-exclusive DS title called Rakubiki Jaiten DS, which was an electronic dictionary developed by Nintendo. By typing in Ball or Game & Watch in the dictionary, players can access the game Ball within the software itself, as well as the game Manhole. While playing, the games will even display the current time on your system, a nod to the game's original functionality that wasn't present in some of the re-releases on the game Boy. Players can also use the control pad or the touchscreen to control both of these games. One of the last official Game & Watch titles was actually a 1991 game titled Mario the Juggler. It was the only Game & Watch released in the 1990s, and features a vibrant, colorful screen. Lakitu and a Hammer Bro make an appearance in this version, with both helping out Mario juggle the balls. Another interesting callback to Ball comes with the Game Boy Camera. With the Game Boy Camera, players could take a picture of their own face and superimpose it on the character from Ball then play the game. Back when Gunpei Yokoi proposed the idea for the Game & Watch to Hiroshi Yamauchi, Yokoi was told that he needed to come up with multiple titles, as Nintendo wouldn't do just one. Ball was the first game Gunpei Yokoi envisioned, but he needed more, so he quickly threw together a whack-a-mole style game called Vermin. Despite the rush design, Vermin became one of the best sellers for the initial batch of titles. Yokoi looked to anime and Japanese folklore for inspiration for the game's designs. Turtle Bridge was partly inspired by the hair of Inaba, a story about how a rabbit tricked sharks in order to cross a body of water. Yamauchi would put intense pressure on Gunpei Yokoi in order to come up with ideas. In the Gunpei Yokoi's Game Museum book, Yokoi reflects on this pressure, saying, Creating those new backgrounds was itself very challenging, and the president would just casually walk over and say, It's that time again, Yokoi. Make me another three Game & Watch games. I found the casualness of those requests exasperating, and privately I thought, Come on, it's not that easy. Consider the guy who actually has to think all this up. The Mario series in particular saw several releases on the Game & Watch. Mario Brothers was a Game & Watch multi-screen title released in 1983. The multi-screen design would later play a part in inspiring the DS line of handhelds, but with the difference being that the Game & Watch would open horizontally like a book instead of vertically. In the game, players control Mario and Luigi as they package cakes. If the player loses, Mario is scalded by his boss. Mario Brothers for the Game & Watch would be re-released several times in the Game & Watch gallery titles, with Bowser and Wario even making an appearance while the two brothers do the heavy lifting. Some of Nintendo's most important series also had entries in the Game & Watch, such as Donkey Kong, Balloon Fight, and The Legend of Zelda. In Game & Watch Zelda, players control Link as he fights eight dragons through eight dungeons. He gains pieces of the Triforce of Wisdom in order to save Princess Zelda and the world. Like many Zelda titles, if Link's hearts are full, he'll shoot a beam from his sword. Donkey Kong Circus was a 1984 title that actually serves as an unofficial prequel to the arcade Donkey Kong. In this title,
level, Mario forces DK to juggle objects while balancing on a barrel. The game has colorful graphics and features Mario in a very similar style to the arcade game's art. The Game & Watch series re-released and reused a lot of concepts throughout its run. Donkey Kong Circus, which itself was a remake of Ball, was also a reskin of an earlier title called Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse and Donkey Kong Circus are so similar that Nintendo even swapped the product numbers during production. Mickey Mouse's product number is DC-95, while Donkey Kong Circus is MK-96, with the MK possibly referring to Mickey. Both titles are part of the Panorama Screen subseries for the Game & Watch, but that wasn't the mouse's only appearance on the handheld. Disney would see two other Mickey Mouse titles for the Game & Watch. Mickey Mouse was released within the widescreen subseries, and Mickey and Donald were different versions of two other Game & Watch games titled Egg and Fire, respectively. Since the Game & Watch series ran for quite some time, it had a number of interesting subseries. The Nintendo vs. series, which were arcade versions of Famicom titles with two-player support, might have inspired the Micro vs. line of games for the Game & Watch. Three titles were released for this series, Punch-Out, Donkey Kong 3, and Donkey Kong Hockey. With Donkey Kong Hockey, the players control Mario and Donkey as they square off in hockey. This Game & Watch title would be the first ever Mario sports title, predating the NES Open Tournament Golf by three years. It's also interesting to note that Mario wasn't even the main star of the title, instead being relegated to the Player 2 spot. The Crystal Screen series were later iterations of Game & Watch, featuring a transparent screen. Climber is an interesting title that was never released in Japan, and would release in the United States one year after Ice Climber debuted, and it's possible the series was meant to be a spiritual sequel to Ice Climber. After the Game & Watch's success, there were a number of knockoffs and imitations. While shopping one day, Gunpei Okoi heard the beeps from Vermin in a Taiwanese knockoff. Off. When he purchased the unit and pried it open, he discovered that the knockoff soccer design just replaced the vermin screen, with the internal system being exactly the same. However, Yokoi wasn't angry, just very surprised. Yokoi said, Thus, when I see a knockoff of something I made, it's proof that my work has made a big impact, and that makes me very happy. Yokoi drew the original Game & Watch characters, but eventually entrusted the design process to a staff member who had skill in drawing manga. The Game & Watch character would be immortalized in the Super Smash Bros. series from Melee onwards. Director Masahiro Sakurai would utilize a number of different Game & Watch titles within the character's moveset. When designing the character for Melee, Sakurai initially wanted to make his movements move frame by frame, but it was too jarring. Instead of actually being a 2D sprite with lo-fi animation, Mr. Game & Watch is a 3D character that's squished down on its Z-axis. When developing Mr. Game & Watch for Melee, Sakurai borrowed the original systems from the Asaku Sabashi branch of Nintendo for research. For the stage, Sakurai wanted techno-sounding music, which Hirokazu Ando, a musician at HAL, provided. One reference that was added to Super Smash Bros. Ultimate ended up getting cut before the game's release. This is because the forward smash attack initially included a culturally insensitive reference to a title called Fire Attack. In Fire Attack, players would control a cowboy who must hit Native Americans with a hammer in order to prevent them from lighting the cowboy's fort on fire. When the game was included in Game & Watch Gallery 4, the Native Americans were updated to be less in line with racist stereotypes. Stereotypes. Nintendo changed the move before Smash Ultimate was released. Did you know? While the Virtual Boy is often considered the brainchild of legendary Japanese designer Gunpei Yokoi, the technology was first created by an American engineer. In 1985, Alan Becker noticed the poor quality of laptop screens and decided to create a small, portable, high-resolution display. He decided to try using an array of light-emitting diodes, or LEDs. The small band of LEDs would change patterns so quickly that they would be seen as a complete image. However, instead of moving the LEDs themselves, Becker would reflect them off an oscillating mirror. Becker named this device the Scanned Linear Array, which was capable of producing a bright, clear image for a low price. The Virtual Boy's signature red color scheme came from the materials Becker had access to at the time. As he lacked the funds to create his own prototype from scratch, he used a cheap red LED array meant for displays on large printers. Becker went on to found Reflection Technology Incorporated in 1986 and developed a miniaturized version of this technology named the Private Eye. 
When viewed from 18 inches away, the Private Eye's 1-inch display was capable of simulating a 12-inch display. While many companies were interested in the technology, none of them managed to find an application useful enough to pass the experimentation phase. By the early 90s, the tech industry was dominated by the idea of virtual reality. Even NASA had its own research lab dedicated to it. Reflection Technology courted the game and toy industries, attempting to capitalize on the craze. They pitched the private eye to Hasbro, Mattel, and Sega, but each company rejected them. It wasn't until 1991 that Reflection finally found a buyer for that technology, Nintendo, who then dominated the games industry. At the time, Gunpei Yokoi felt out of place in gaming, as he thought the medium was too focused on flashy graphics and catering to a hardcore audience. Audience. He intended to retire from Nintendo the following year and establish his own company where he had more direct creative control. But then the private eye showed up. During Reflection's demonstration of the tech, then Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamauchi fell asleep. While this seemed dismissive, it was actually a green light. He was sending the message that his employees could proceed without his supervision, and Nintendo acquired exclusive worldwide video game licensing rights to the technology in 1992. Using the tech, the Virtual Boy was developed by Nintendo Research and Development 1 and went under the working title VR32. Gunpei Yokoi was enthusiastic about the head-tracking technology, which would make the console's graphics move with the user's head movements. In fact, VR32 was initially meant to be a pair of wearable goggles. However, Nintendo's engineers were concerned about having a chip that produced high-frequency radio emissions so close to a user's head as the effects of EMF radiation on the human body were not well understood at the time. The chip also produced a lot of noise. To protect the user from these issues, a metal plate was installed around the CPU. Unfortunately, this made the goggles too heavy to move around. The team also had concerns about motion sickness and risk of injury, and so Nintendo scrapped the idea of head tracking. But that wasn't the end of the console's potential health risks. Reflection encouraged Nintendo to hire Dr. Ellie Pelly of the Scapin's Eye Research Institute to determine whether the console was harmful to the eyes. Pelly found that the console was harmless, with one exception. If a child around the ages of 5 and 7 were to play a system with both displays misaligned, they could develop lazy eye. Nintendo used rigid materials to ensure this wouldn't happen. While the problem was solved, new product liability laws forced Nintendo's hand, and they included warnings on the packaging that children under 7 should not play the Virtual Boy. They also installed a software timer reminding users to take a break from the console every 15 minutes. While these warnings were precautionary and included for legal reasons, they gave the impression the Virtual Boy was detrimental to people's health. Sensational headlines swept Japan as the console launched. Further problems came from within Nintendo. Sony's PlayStation and the Sega Saturn were due out in 1994, but the Nintendo 64 wouldn't be ready for launch until 1996. Most of Nintendo's money and attention was devoted to the Nintendo 64. As such, the Virtual Boy was pressured to release as soon as possible to bridge the gap in income. Not only that, but Yamauchi instructed Yokoi to de-emphasize Mario and the Virtual Boy so his 3D debut in Super Mario 64 would be all the more impactful. R&D 1 attempted to make their own games while also relying on their frequent collaborators' intelligent systems to create original software for the console. But both teams lacked the time and resources to create games that really took advantage of the system's unique hardware. Ultimately, the console only had 22 games over the course of its lifespan. Faith in the product plummeted, and even Yokoi expressed doubts about the system. Nintendo faced stiff competition, with Sony and Sega both launching their 32-bit consoles that year. Nintendo had spent a considerable amount of time and money on VR32, even buying a manufacturing plant in China for it. Along with these large expenses, public response to the Virtual Boy was tepid. Fans and critics had been expecting a next-generation powerhouse, and the red and black visuals and toy-like appearance of the console turned many away. While the console was more powerful than the Super NES and Mega Drive, it was also at an extreme disadvantage, as it had to display two screens at once. Now, this made it difficult for Nintendo to demonstrate its true power. The system's 3D capabilities were also less than impressive. 3D accelerators were a new technology at the time and couldn't be included in a portable console 
console because they used too much space and power. Even with this energy conscious design, the machine still took six AA batteries to run. Despite these problems, Yamauchi remained confident, boldly proclaiming they would sell three million units in Japan alone. Ultimately, the console sold less than 800,000 units worldwide. While Nintendo boasted of being sold out in America, this was only because they shipped an extremely limited number of units. Some stores received as few as two systems. Prices dropped rapidly, yet low sales persisted, preventing the chance of a European release. There were a number of contributing factors to the public's disinterest, a lack of software, a reputation to cause eye strain, back strain, and headaches, a lack of portability, and the antisocial nature of the hardware itself. The name Virtual Boy drew unfavorable comparisons with the wildly successful Game Boy. Miyamoto would later say that Nintendo gave mixed signals to consumers by developing two consoles simultaneously, both marketed on their 3D capabilities. The Nintendo 64 used revolutionary 3D technology, whereas the Virtual Boy was iterative, using established technology but with a 3D display. Some developers did praise the console, however. Steve Wota, who worked on Ocean's Waterworld, considered it a great piece of technology and felt it could have reached its full potential given a couple of years. Miyamoto felt it wasn't that the Virtual Boy was a failure, but that it was marketed in a poor light. In an Iwata Asks interview, he said, When you think of it as a game console, selling 100,000 units is just a start. But if you think of it as a fun toy, it's a big success if you break just 50,000. Viewed like that, it was, I think, quite an appealing toy. When you think of it as a gaming platform, it becomes a failure. Rumors suggested Yokoi became an outcast within Nintendo following the console's launch and that he resigned as a result, but he intended to leave the company even before the Virtual Boy began development. Yokoi took responsibility for the failure of the console by designing Nintendo's next successful portable venture, the Game Boy Pocket, before leaving in August 1996. His profound impact on the gaming industry was not damaged by the Virtual Boy, and upon his departure, Nintendo lost shares so rapidly the Tokyo Stock Exchange had to cease operations. The late Nintendo president Satoru Iwata said that after the Virtual Boy's failure, it would have been understandable for Nintendo to shy away from 3D technology. However, the company continued to pursue the concept, encouraged by Yamauchi and Miyamoto's enthusiasm for it. A working prototype of the 3DS's technology was functioning as early as the Game Boy Advance SP. Additionally, the GameCube had 3D compatibility built into the system, but it required an expensive LCD that would far exceed the price of the the console itself. Iwata felt at the time of the 3DS's release that Nintendo had achieved the fruition of its many attempts of a 3D-capable console. The Virtual Boy has been referenced in a lot of Nintendo games following its release. The console appears in the background of the trophy room in Super Smash Bros. Melee if the player sets the language to Japanese in the NTSE version. It can be spotted in the background of Francis's room in Super Paper Mario, as well as 9 Volts Stage in WarioWare Inc. Mega Micro Games. A Virtual Boy can also be obtained in Animal Crossing New Leaf, Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal, Pokemon Stadium 2, and Mi Plaza. It can even be found in Tamodachi Life, and was was prominently featured in the game's Nintendo Direct. The console is also referenced outside of Nintendo games. A modified Virtual Boy is used in the manga AI Ga Tamaranai. An ad for the console can be seen in the background of the Simpsons game. Additionally, a VB mode can be unlocked in the Game Boy Advance version of Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance. Activating this mode will turn the whole screen red. The Virtual Boy's failure appears to have influenced Nintendo's approach to VR even to this day. In an interview with Bloomberg in 2016, then President of Nintendo America, Reggie fils claimed Nintendo wanted to ensure virtual reality represents strong value to the consumer before pursuing it again. He said a mainstream, mass-market application of VR technology was perhaps further away than some anticipated. Nintendo was willing to go ahead with VR, but only after players could use the technology for hours on end without problems. However, they appear to still be experimenting. A tentative step towards VR came from Nintendo Labo. Compatible modes were built into Super Mario Odyssey and The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, and more recently, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. 